Where did your dreams go? The dreams of childhood? Wishes of the young and innocent heart? The hopes to make the team or to make the winning play? To make your family proud? The dreams to go somewhere? To do something? To become something? To get out ahead of the world? To leave behind your fears and worries? To see how vast and beautiful the world can be? To discover, to dare, to dive in, to know and be known, to love and be loved. All of those dreams, where did they go? One day we wake up and we feel the weight of our decisions, the consequences of what we've done and what's been done to us, the words, the actions, the lies, the addictions, the shame, the cycles, anger, the spiral. There's an emptiness that sets in. And all the years, the days and the dreams that are gone, we wake up and realize we're not as strong as we think we are. And it may have taken a great sorrow for us to realize that. But thankfully, you're not the only one with a dream for your life. There is one, our maker, our creator, the dream giver, who before you were even born had a plan for your life, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. The one who imagined you, who delights in you, who gave up his own life for you. He has a plan for you. It's bigger than your mistakes, bigger than your regrets, bigger than all the hurts, hangups, and habits that have tried to steal your hope. No matter where you've been, and no matter what you've done, you're not too far gone. God is for you, and his dreams for your future are good. A future of joy, a future of purpose, a future filled with redemption and renewal, promise, and possibility. Don't stop now. Don't give up yet. This is the part where the story gets good, where the battles are won, where the prodigals come home, where the dead awaken to life. Your past it's not your future. There is a God who does the impossible. There is more to come. Come, rejoice with us. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. Good morning. Uh, my, my name is Derek, and I'm a grateful believer in Christ. I struggle with anger, codependency, and perfectionism, uh, and it's great to see you this morning. So I want to welcome you to Northside Christian Church. Um, whether you're here in person or watching online, we're so glad that you've chosen to join uh, worship with us today. Um, if, uh, if you need to contact the church about anything, uh, you can do that by emailing the staff. It's office at nschristianchurch.org, or you guys know the Connect cards. You can scan the QR codes up on the screen or on the bulletins. To connect you with the connect card and there you can um, um, you know fill that out uh, there's also paper copies in the back uh, if you guys need paper copies you can fill those out and put them in the offering boxes that's just a way for you to connect with the church and the church to connect with you um, let us know if you have any prayer requests etc so um, so hopefully you've noticed that things started a little bit differently this morning uh, in honor of September being National Recovery Month uh, we wanted to tell you all, kind of highlight a little bit about our Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets right here on Thursday nights at 6.30. we got a meal at 5.45, and, um, and it's been going great. So tell you a little bit about uh, what God's doing through that ministry. You may have already met some of our leaders when you came in this morning, so we're the weird folks wearing the CR shirts uh, that you see around here. Um, and we're just excited that you're, that you're here this morning. Um, you also, I'm excited to say, you'll actually get a chance to hear from a few of them during our service, um, so that's awesome. The very first thing, though, I want to do is to say thank you, Northside, to the church for your support of the ministry. Um, please know that, that your support is transforming lives, um, transforming lives in this community. Uh, I want to specifically recognize those that have volunteered and supported CR in some way, so if you've helped in any way, like if you've brought a side dish for a meal or brought a meal or done a dessert or uh, moved a chair or a table 
or all the many things that uh, child care, the things that it takes to um, kind of host CR. If you've done that or, or helped in any way, would you please stand just so we can recognize you and say thank you? All right. All right, so thank you. Keep standing just for a second. I do have something that we want to hand out to you guys. This is just a token of appreciation um, for your service to the ministry um, in that way. So. Uh, in CR, we're big on coins and chips, uh, and we recognize milestones, and we celebrate things like this. And so this is uh, what they're giving you guys is a service coin, and while they're giving it to you guys, let me uh, just read what's inscribed on it. Uh, it's a verse. It's Isaiah 6, uh, verse 8. It says, Then I heard the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Um, so thank you all. Um, for what you're doing and your help and support uh, of this ministry. I've got one up here in my hand, and I've just noticed Wayne is standing up here up front. So I'm going to give this one to Wayne Courier. And if you guys should come as no surprise to you all that Wayne does so much um, for the church as a whole, but for this ministry as well, helping coordinate meals, uh, helping set up the tables and chairs uh, here late. Uh, he, he does a lot of stuff, but he never asks for anything in return. So Wayne, my friend, thank you. So again, thank you guys. So um, just real quick, back to that opening video. Thank you. Oh, I should have brought more on the stage with me. Um, so back to that opening video. I love that opening video, uh, and I've seen it many, many times, but I still get tearful when I watch it. And, and it's that opening line where did your dreams go? And I don't know about you, but that hits home for me as I think about, as I think about my life, because it wasn't that long ago when I was in a rut at work, stressed, overwhelmed. There was uh, some darkness in me that would come out as anger at home. And one Sunday morning, about six years ago, I blew up at my kids, which to be honest, wasn't that uncommon for that season of life for me. But uh, the difference was in this instance, I blew up and I kicked my son's Batman toy through our living room window. And the glass shattered, and my kids were in tears. And uh, I remember looking at my son's face, and through his tears, he said, why did you do that? And I was trying to get them ready for church that morning. Like, how ironic, right? I was trying to get them ready to come here. Actually, the old building. And, uh, and they weren't cooperating like I wanted them to. Um, we were going to be late, and, uh, and my attempt was to take control of the situation. And when Drew asked me that question, why did I do that, I had no answer for him. I left the kids crying in the living room because I just couldn't, I couldn't face it. I went to, the, to our bedroom, and uh, I got on my knees, and I prayed for something to change. I had no idea what I was praying for. I had nothing specific in mind. I just knew that what I was doing wasn't working and I didn't like where the next steps of things were going to go and so that was the start of my recovery journey um, dealing with my anger and so uh, if you look up the definition of recovery you'll find this it's the action or process of regaining possession of something stolen or lost and the way we say that all the time at CR we all say that we're in recovery we're in recovery not to stop doing an action. We're actually in recovery to regain the life God originally had planned for us. And, uh, and a life that the devil had stolen from us, to be quite frank. A life that Jesus described in John 10, 10 as a life to the full. A life that's better than we can imagine. So a little bit about Celebrate Recovery. It's an international ministry. So there are over 35,000 ministries uh, that meet in churches all around the world. Uh, this week alone, over 8 million people will get up and introduce themselves just the way I did when I stood up here this morning. And um, it's a program that guides us along a path of 12 steps uh, that help us change our lifestyle while we're learning the eight principles that help us improve the way we think. And those eight principles are based on the Beatitudes, so from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And at the center of it all, then, at the center of all of this is Christ, and that's the only way it can be. The national statistics, about a third of people that come to Celebrate Recovery are there for an addiction to alcohol or drugs. So it certainly works for that, but it's much bigger than that. Two-thirds of the majority of people come to Celebrate Recovery for something else. Some other hurt, habit, or hang-up, some resentment, some anger, some issue that they 
that has separated them from God. And so, um, and so CR is about recovering that relationship with God. Everything else is secondary, meaning it comes as a benefit of that relationship. And I have experienced it. Um, I've seen people be transformed. I've seen God do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And I have no choice but to stand here and tell you all about it, too. Um, so back to the opening line, where did your dreams go? Uh, if that question stirs up something in you like it does in me, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Um, or better yet, we'd love to see you on Thursday night. I appreciate you all for letting me share uh, this morning. Uh, we have, uh, I forgot to say this, we, we always need help and support and volunteers. If, um, if you can help in child care or anything else or, or want to do those things, we, we will be in the back back there at the information table after the service. Um, and if you want, we can, you can look at what's available and sign up for a service opportunity there. We'd very much appreciate that. There's a bunch of information back there. And if Charles was here, he would tell you that it's an information table. And we call it that because it's a table. And guess what? It's got information on it. Uh, so there's a bunch of information back there. If you could use any of it, please take it. If you know somebody else that could use any of it, please take it and, and spread it to this community. Thank you, guys. Uh, I may be over my allotted time, but I'm going to pray for us here in just a second. Before I do, another quick reminder. So halfway through our service, our middle schoolers will ju join our student minister. Is Clay in here or is he already back? He's probably back. Okay, he's already back there. So about halfway through, then the middle schoolers can join Clay in the back uh, in the youth room for their weekly breakout conversation and study on today's sermon topic. So would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for, um, for your hope that you give us, for your grace that you give us. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for a ministry like Celebrate Recovery that helps us put aside all the, quite frankly, all the garbage in life and focus on you. I thank you that you love us, that even while we were still sinners, you died on the cross for us. Lord, I just pray for this morning that, um, that you be glorified. I pray for the worship team. I pray for Nick as he delivers his sermon. And I pray for the others that will be up here as well. And Lord, I just uh, I give you all the praise and glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join as we sing together? Who you say I am? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love.
remain standing as our scripture is read today. Hey everybody, my name is Chris. Uh, I am a grateful believer in Christ Jesus. Uh, my past struggles have been with drugs and alcohol addiction. Uh, my current struggles are with pride, um, a little bit of anger, and uh, a little bit of codependency. Uh, and, and that's that's something that I, I want to stress about CR. Um, only one in three people that attend CR are there for alcohol or drug addiction. Um, it's pretty much what is blocking you back from the sunlight of the spirit. Um, I mean, it could be anger. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. Um, it's whatever's holding us back uh, from Christ. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to read Psalm 119, uh, verses 30 through 33 through 40. I'm sorry. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statues and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts and your righteousness preserve my life. Thank Amen. You. you may be seated. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see everyone here today. I want to welcome you to Northside this morning, everyone here in person. Those of you online today, we're glad to have you here with us as well. And I really appreciate everybody sharing, Derek and others uh, from, uh, from CR with us today, uh, and look forward to just spending this, the rest of this time together as we uh, get into God's Word. Peter Drucker tells a very interesting story about the German scientist who is credited with first synthesizing Novocaine. If you've ever had a dental procedure, you're probably familiar with the use of, of Novocaine. Uh, and are probably very thankful for the use of Novocaine. Uh, it was developed in the early 20th century, and this scientist who created Novocaine, he intended it to be used for major surgical procedures like amputations. That was the original intent uh, for, for Novocaine. Uh, but surgeons didn't like it. They preferred total anesthesia. And uh, I prefer total anesthesia as well. <laughs> Please knock me out if you're going to amputate something uh, from, from me. But it became favored, of course, by dentists. And a lot of us, again, aren't we grateful for Novocaine, you know, in the middle of those dental procedures and things. But, you know, one man was not grateful for what it ended up being used for, and that was its inventor. He actually kind of despised that it was being used for dental procedures because that was not part of the plan. <laughs> that was not what he intended it for. And so he would spend the rest of his career traveling to dental schools, forbidding dentists from using Novocaine in their procedures. He was not in control of how his invention was being used, and he was struggling with that. And now we're lucky, of course, that he wasn't in control, because if he wasn't in control, we would be without Novocaine in, in the dental procedures we have. Imagine inventing Novocaine and then trying to squelch its greatest use simply because it wasn't part of your plan. How much peace, I wonder, did this man rob himself of in the latter part of his life simply because he couldn't yield to reality? He just simply could not yield to the reality in front of him. He couldn't wave the white flag. Say, I get it. I get the picture. A pet store delivery truck was going down the road, and at every stoplight the man would come to who was driving the truck, he'd get out of the, he'd get out of the car, and he'd take a two-by-four out, and he'd run to the back of the truck, and he'd beat the back end of the truck, and then get back in the car, and then go to the next stoplight and do the same. He kept doing this at every light, and eventually, people you know, were kind of wondering, like, you know, what was going on? Eventually, somebody got up the nerve to ask the man, what in the world are you doing? And he said, well, this is a two-ton truck, and I've got four tons of canaries in the back, and I've got to keep at least two tons of them in the air at all times. <laughs> That's a picture for a lot of us as life as we know it, Right? We're, we're driving around in a two, our, our two-ton truck trying to keep four tons of canaries <laughs> you know, in the back and keep it from breaking us down. And we're all the time going back and beating it with that two-by-four like crazy people in that same cycle all the time just to keep everything from crashing down. And I wonder today, what if God simply wanted to come up to each of us today, tap us on the shoulder and say, you know what, it doesn't have to be this way. If you were to come up and say, you know, I don't think the canaries are the problem. <laughs> I think it's the plan of the driver. And would you just, would you, would you let me kind of show you a different way of doing this, a different way of tackling this issue? I wonder how we would respond to that in our own situation. I love Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott is a very straightforward person, and I love how sometimes she just speaks with straightforward clarity, and she does, particularly on this subject. She speaks with clarity when she says, the difference between you and God is that God doesn't think he's you. <laughs> how so many of us, we get that the wrong way, don't we? We think, you know, I'm in control. It's all about control. I'm in control, and we have a hard time waving the white flag to God. But in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, here's the promise God gives us. He says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. This is actually Christ saying this. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that verse. I love the peace that comes over me when I read that verse, yet there's also a challenge there, right? God says, I'm, it's, it's, I'm going to lighten your load. You'll have relief. You'll have release. You'll have rejuvenation. A lot of us already, we're like two or three weeks into the school year. We're like, I need rejuvenation. <laughs> it sounds good. And God says, okay, just give me care and control of your life. 
Whoa, whoa. We rarely take him up on this good promise for the following five reasons described by Rick Warren. The first one is pride. Pride. Pride often keeps me from admitting I need help. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 8 says this, The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. So maybe we say, I'm not ready to take that step of, 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 of surrendering to God. I'm not ready to, to give him control and, and care of my life. I'm not ready to do that yet. And okay, you know, God will probably allow a little bit more pain, a greater dose, and he'll gladly do so to get our attention. He wants to get our attention. Shame also keeps us from taking the step of surrender to God. Psalm chapter 40 verse 12 says this, For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. How many of us walk around life and maybe even walked around our relationship with God kind of with our head down? We're afraid to look at him. We don't feel like we can look at him. We don't feel that we can approach him. Folks, God is the most approachable person, truthfully, in our life. From what the Bible tells us, he's the most approachable person, yet so much shame keeps us from being able to lift our gaze to him. We think that, that you know, we're, not, we're not worthy or he, we don't deserve God's help. And the opposite is true. Third, fear. I'm afraid of what I have to give up to follow God's plan. We like to keep God as our last resort. I'm going to hold on to everything else that I can in life. I'm going to hold on to that relationship. I'm going to hold on to that ambition of mine, that habit, that lifestyle, that possession. I'm going to hold on to all of that as much as I can. God's going to be my last resort. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 warns us, though, the words of Jesus, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Worry is another aspect of fear that we would call anxiety. It often keeps us from surrendering as well. I'm a, you've heard me talk about this many times. I'm a warrior. I'm an anxious person. I have, I'm, I'm always walking through life, every conversation, interaction. I'm always tempted to be thinking three or four or five steps ahead, never being present in the conversation I'm in because I'm always trying to anticipate all the outcomes. How many of you like to anticipate outcomes all the time? We like to get wrapped up in that. You can't anticipate them all. And sometimes we look at what God wants to do, and we're trying to anticipate all the outcomes, all the next steps. And, and it's like, no, I just, God's like, I need you to just focus on what's in front of us here. <laughs> I'll take care of the rest, Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on or bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The message is this. Today, whatever the next step is God has, has put there in front of us, we have what we need today for that next step. And when the other steps come, and the, the other steps will come, we, we trust, we walk in trust that when we come to that point, God will give us what we need then, and we walk in faith in that way. Number five, doubt. Doubt is the fifth of these. We say to ourselves, I want to believe you, God, but my faith is just so small. There's a story about a, a father of a son who was possessed by a demon in Mark chapter 9. And his father comes to Jesus one day, and he says, Jesus, I know you can heal people. My son is one of those people. He needs to be healed. And Jesus tells him, essentially, hey, if, if you have faith that, that he'll be healed, he, he'll be healed. The father's just dead honest with him. He says, listen, Lord, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I actually have a lot of doubts. I have a lot of doubts. I, I want to believe. Hel help me with my unbelief. And Jesus says something very curious, I think, that would be actually kind of counter intuitive to a lot of us today he says okay basically that's enough that does it that, that works for me and he heals the boy he, he didn't sit there and say oh no you've got i can't do it yet because you still your faith is not complete he says the just the desire for this man to have faith the desire to have faith was enough for jesus to say yeah okay we'll, we'll do this maybe we need to say like the father did god i want to believe that you will help me with my life help me with my unbelief it's not the size of our faith that matters it's the size of who we put the faith in. It's not the size of our faith that matters. A lot of our health and wealth gospel friends might really have a problem with that, but me saying that, but it's not the size of your faith. Not having enough faith, it's how big is God? Is God big enough? If we put, it in the, if we put a lot of faith in the wrong thing, we get no results. There's a major question we have to ask today. And it's this, if we want to begin to see change in our life, this thing that we keep putting off till tomorrow, if we want to see it become reality today, the big question we have to ask ourselves is this, are we ready to yield to God? Are we ready to yield to him? I want you to take a look with me today at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is where we're going to be. We're just going to read a couple of verses here. And here's what it says. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, this is Paul writing, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The book of Romans is, is one of the most amazing and foundational books of Christian theology you will find in the Bible. It's, it's just amazing in the depth and the breadth and the detail of Christian theology. Paul, Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and it's probably a pretty good thing that he writes with such detail and depth to the people at Rome. Because if you think about it, the, the people who are believers at Rome are where? They're in the belly of the beast, right? They are literally, you can't get more in Caesar's backyard, than, than where they are in that moment. And so it's really probably pretty important for them to, to receive such detail and such depth on Christian theology from Paul. A lot of good things uh, in the book of Romans. That's why you, a lot of times you hear sermons and you hear it, it stated so often because there's just so much foundational to the Christian faith that's found there. And so he writes this, he writes this letter to the, the, the church at Rome. And the cool thing about what he does in the beginning of it, he spends the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans talking about the mercy and grace of God. He spends the first 11 chapters talking about God's grace, his goodness, this free and wonderful gift that we have been given because of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the, the justification that we now have in front of him, the forgiveness and all of these things. Some of the most foundational Christian scriptures are found in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. I want to just give you, just to give you a flavor, I'm not going to get to all of them, but I'll give you a flavor of what's in those first 11 chapters. And some of you will remember these. Even if you didn't know you remembered them, you'll remember them when I hear them. Romans 3, 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Good news, right? Good news. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. So the law is there to make us see basically just how big sin is and how prevalent sin is and how much there is sin around us. So the law comes in to increase the trespass, to help it become all seen. But then he writes, but where sin increased... Grace increased all the more. Good news. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Now there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is good news. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Good news. And this, I could just go on more and more verses like that one in those first 11 chapters of Romans. So you see this. Here is Paul. He is sending this letter. The first 11 chapters is like spiritual vitamin C. Like just like pumping them up and saying, here is the good news of Jesus Christ. Chapter 12. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, in view of the first 11 chapters of this letter that I've written, Paul, by the way, didn't write it in chapters. Those kind of came later. <laughs> but in view of everything I've just said in this letter, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As Dr. Jack Cottrell says this, he says, the very contemplation of the mercies of God compels us to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices to him. This is the essence of Christian, Christian theology, Christian belief. We don't do good things in order to achieve the life. We've been given the life as a gift, and we do good things because we've been given the life. We've been given life in Christ. That's the response. It's a response. It's not we're doing it to attain. It's, it's the response to what has been given to us. And so we now live, well, what is this new way in which we now live? Well, so, a little bit later on, chapter 12, verse 9, Paul's going to give a great summary of really what the new way of living is, and that's this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Let love be genuine. Genuine love. We are compelled now, because of Christ, to live with a genuine love for God and a genuine love for others. It's not a love that feels put on. It's not like a love we put on as a costume when we walk out the door because we need to present that to the world. What we're being called to here, this new, this new life, is, is a love that comes from within first. 
and then becomes what we, what, we, what we carry with us, what we do, how we live. It's very genuine. It's inside and out, not just the outside. And that leads to action. But here's our dilemma. This is a transformation we all want to see, right? We all want to see that. I want to honor God by living right. I want to live in a way that no longer hurts the people around me. Maybe some of us are like, you know what? I've known this verse. Here's the problem. A lot of us, we say, we know that we've known this verse all of our lives. I'm still waiting on the transformation. I haven't seen it. Hasn't made a lick of difference. What, 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 where is the transformation, God? Where is it? Well, if we dig into this verse some more, I think we're going to find something very, very helpful. I'm going to zero in today on two verbs, two verbs in, the, in, verse, cha- in verse 2 that I think are going to help maybe unlock something for someone today. Now, you're going to sit here, and he's going to, I'm going to start talking about Greek, and you're going to say, oh, man, and we're going to get a Greek lesson today, and I'll do as best I can to make it as relatable as possible. We're not going to get really deep in the weeds, but it is going to be helpful, and I really believe it's going to help unlock something in the transformation process for someone here today. Conform and transform. Those are the two verbs I want to focus on in, in this passage. In the original Greek, the tense of these two verbs is as follows. So there's a present tense, passive voice, imperative mood. In the original Greek, they're in the present tense, they're in the passive voice, they're in the imperative mood. What does that mean? Well, let me explain that here, and it'll really unlock something, I think. Present tense is this. Present tense means, you know, every time I'm living, I'm in the present. Present is always. Present is where I am, always. When I am open my eyes, I'm in the present. Present is something that is ongoing. It means something that is never like, it's not a one time and then done kind of thing. I'm always in the present. And that means things that are in the present, verbs that are in the present in the Greek mean there's something that's a continual action. They're always ongoing. Transformation is an ongoing process, is what Paul's saying. The conforming, the transforming, ongoing process. Never, it's, it's never like we, we did it, it's done, it's in the past. Transformation is not a one-time act, and we will set ourselves up for failure and future resentment if we treat it like it is, if we approach it like it is, if we expect healing and recovery to be something that's fixed one day, never an issue again. Now, I've grown up in the church like a lot of you have, and uh, one thing I began to notice as I got older and I began to deal really with my own story, as I began to try to reconcile some things in, in my own story, as I began to really look back at the church culture that so many of us grow up in, and I began to notice something. You know, we really love testimonies. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But one thing in particular about the testimonies we hear, so often those testimonies in the culture we grew up in always had to have victory, right? Like, there are those, maybe you got the sense that I can't tell my story unless the, it's the, the, the hurt's a part of the past, Unless it's something behind me. Uh, maybe the, the, the churches we grew up in, maybe that's the idea they communicated. You didn't really have a testimony a- until it was part of the past. And, and the stories always had to have victory where it was part of the past. I'm fixed. I'm, I'm moving on. And, you know, I have a problem with that now as an adult. Because I look at what Peter or what Paul just said here, and I say, that doesn't seem like Christian theology. That doesn't seem consistent with the scripture I see. Paul's setting sitting a different expectation here. We're all in process. We're all in process. It's more of a red flag to me now when someone comes up and tries to portray the idea that they've got it all fixed and licked and it's all behind them. I'm actually more of a red flag there <laughs> than someone who sits there and, and then, as opposed to someone who comes up and talks about their sin and their struggle in the present tense. That person, I lean in when I start to hear that person. That person, I think, is being more honest and realistic. I think God is inviting a lot of us to be softer on ourselves and softer on our expectations in this regard. So it's present tense. It's an ongoing process. Passive voice means this. Passive voice means that when you're talking about a verb, we're not the ones doing the action. There's somebody else doing the action. And that's what it tells us here is that transformation is something done to us, not by us. Transformation is something done to us, not by us. The conforming and transforming is really, in the end, not something we can do ourselves. It's God, and it's God alone. And it's also something that God wants everyone to experience. He wants everyone to have that transformation. Some of you might be out there doubting. God, like, I don't see this. Maybe it's because you just don't want it for me. That's not true. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants everybody to experience this transformation. But it's him. It's him that does it. 
what is this all? Let's talk about it for a minute. Let me first say this. Eric Metaxas, I think, hits home when he says this. If someone believes it is our faith that heals us and forgets that it is God who does, then we should ask that person how much faith Lazarus had. Think about that. How did, much faith did Lazarus have as he's sitting in the grave four days before Jesus healed him? It's God that does it. And if we're honest, this is the truth in our lives as well. Think back to the time, the last time maybe you made a significant life change and, and you made significant change and transformation. You had that experience in your life. When you did the hard work of change, what was it that brought it about? There are usually two things that bring it about. Deep pain or deep love. And honestly, most of the time, it's deep pain. Deep pain. God will use deep pain to finally get our attention. And as Paul indicates for us today in Romans chapter 12, he uses deep love to keep us in the process. In view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. Again, God, we begin to realize that he is the most approachable person in our life, not the least approachable. And it's that deep love that we see that he has for us that keeps us coming back, that keeps us turning to him, that keeps us refocusing with him and keeps us in that process. It is the deep pain he allows into our life that brings us to him. It's his deep love that keeps us there. It's him. It isn't us. <laughs> it's him. But here's what we also see. The imperative mood is that third part of this Greek language that we see here. And there is something for us in all of this. Imperative means there's sort of like the idea of a command being given. Now, there is a command being given to us, and that's this. Transformation requires us to do one thing at this point. Yield to God. Yield. Yield to God. There's something we're responsible for in all of this. We're responsible to desire the change. We're responsible to consent to it. And we're responsible to yield ourselves to the work God wants to do in our life. I think Charles Cranfield, the old theologian, really summarized this whole passage in Romans the best when he said, I think it's actually the best translation of this passage, when he said this. This is what it really is saying. Continue to let yourselves be transformed. That's the message of this passage. Continue to let yourselves be transformed. Lisa Turkhurst writes this. She says, C.S. Lewis created a beautiful word picture that I like to think of when I can't understand what God is doing. He told us to think of ourselves as a house that God is renovating. We think we know what work needs to be done. Maybe some small repairs here and there. And then he starts knocking down walls. And we're confused and we're feeling the pain of this level of rebuilding. But maybe his vision is much different than ours. What is God's vision for our transformation? What does it look like for God to transform us? We think about that end result. Yeah, we want to have an authentic, sincere love. Again, Romans 12, 9. But even more so, let's paint the picture more deeply. What does God expect this to look like? Richard Rohr describes the situation this way. He says this, To finally surrender ourselves to healing, we must have three spaces opened within us, and all of them at the same time. Our opinionated head, our closed-down heart, and our defensive and defended body. That is the work of spirituality, and it is work. And if you look closely at our passage today, all three of those areas, they're there. Do you see them? All three of the mind, heart, body, all of them are there. And we're being called to open them up. God is opening our heart with his mercy. Again, in view of God's mercy, that's the God inviting us to open our heart to him. That's the first work there. And then God renovating our mind with his word, that we may be able to, what, test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then also God is calling us to pay attention to our bodies. Another way of looking at that operating as a living sacrifice would be to also think about it this way. Maybe this might be helpful to someone here today. Permitting our body to live with all of its vital energy in the life God intended for us. To live with all of its vital energy. Living in the mercy of God. Yielding to God isn't just submitting to one of these areas. It's submitting in all three of them simultaneously. And that's why Irenaeus said this centuries ago, the glory of God is man fully alive. Man fully alive. Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. He said, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. So here's the message today. If you haven't picked up on it by now, (laughs) 
Yield your life fully to reflect Jesus in genuine love. Yield your life fully to, tru- to reflect Jesus. Oh, yield your life to fully reflect Jesus in genuine love. And John Eldridge quickly here says three, tells three ways we can do this in his book, Waking the Dead. The first is listening for God's voice. Listen for God's voice. This, again, involves the mind, right? This is the openness of our mind. I want you, first of all, let's start with the assumption that God is still speaking today. God is still speaking to us today. And Eldridge gives an example of how this played out in his own life. He says, two years ago, we, went, we spent a wonderful family vacation at a ranch here in Colorado, horseback riding, campfires, porch swings, home cooking. He said it was one of the best weeks we'd had together in a long time. And so when it came to making plans again for this summer, the, or the past summer, he said it seemed like a no-brainer to us. We just assumed we'd go back and do it again. Heck, it'd be even better the second time because we'd be familiar with the place, and wouldn't it be neat to kind of build a family tradition? But as we asked God about our plans, Stacy, his wife, he says, Stacy and I, we sensed God saying, not this year. It was hard counsel to accept. Everybody wanted to go back. Three times we asked God about it, and each time he said no. And then later that year, that that summer, when the Haman fire burned 137,000 acres of Colorado in June, we looked at each other and realized that that was the week we would have been at the ranch. It was almost totally engulfed in flames. God made known to us the path of life. And notice he says that we must ask, and sometimes we will struggle to hear and struggle with what we hear, but personally he says it's worth it. I'm after the path of life, and he alone knows it. So listen for God's voice. Secondly, pay attention to your heart. Here we go, the heart, the heart opening up again. Pay attention to your heart. Eldridge also says this. He says, often before I head out on a mission or something, or, or, a, a travel of some sort, I'll ask God for his advanced words for me, for this, this upcoming travel. And he says it's proven to be a vital part of staying close to him and avoiding disaster. And he said, last fall, I was finishing a brutal tour of 28 different trips. He speaks around the country and the world a lot. He says, as I was heading out for the final engagement, and doing so very reluctantly, I might add, asking God to cancel the flight, bring a snowstorm, anything that might interrupt things, (laughs) God said this to him, do not give way to cynicism. And so he wrote it down. He said, I wrote it down in my journal because I forget stuff like this when the forest grows dim and the other voices begin to chatter and chant. But to be honest, I wasn't really sure why God said that. And then he says, the trip turned into an ordeal. My flight was delayed. This is like a total trains, planes, and automobiles thing. <laughs> my, my flight was delayed. I missed my connection. I missed my ride to the hotel. He said, when I finally got there around midnight, I hadn't eaten all day. No restaurants were open. I couldn't get to a fast food joint. The vending machine had swallowed my, at the hotel had swallowed my last two quarters. The key I was handed was the key to the room, the last, the last available room in the entire building, which was overlooking the trash bins. It smelled of 30 years of cigarettes and cheap beer. And a bare light bulb hung from the ceiling. You get this picture. The hot tap water didn't work. All sorts of thoughts and impulses began to occur to me. What a lousy day. Boy, it's great to be in God's service. What a stinking room. This is how this ministry takes care of its guests? No wonder nobody wants to come here. I wish I hadn't even come. And you can just, that spirit, just overwhelming. What a waste of time. He says, my attitude was going south on a greased pole. And then he said, I remembered God's warning. Do not give way to cynicism. Oh, that's what he meant. I fought cynicism through the hours of the night, battling for my heart. But the new day brought a series of beautiful sessions in the event that I was brought there to be part of. Rescued again. Thirdly, stay close to God's friends. Stay close to God's friends. Get alongside people who walk with God. Approach the scriptures not so much as a manual of Christian principles, but the testimony of God's friends on what it means to walk with him through a thousand different episodes. Eldridge calls for each person to be surrounded by small, trusted, intimate, messy communities of other believers who see each other's lives the way you would if you were camping together in the desert without tents. (laughs) All your stuff is scattered out there for everybody to see. Anyone can, look, you know, anyone can look captured for Christ for an hour a week from a distance in their Sunday best. But in those situations, in those communities, your life is open to those you're living in community with. Where can you find that kind of community today? We're looking for it. A lot of us are longing for it. Where do we find it? There are many different ways perhaps we can answer that. I know of one. 
for a lot of us and a lot of people, it's Thursday night, 5.45 p.m., the meal here, the large group session, 6.30 p.m., celebrate recovery. Are we willing to yield to others, to God, I'm sorry, are we willing to yield to God and then let others in to our life? Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this, in confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. If a Christian is in the fellowship of confession with a brother, he will never be alone again anywhere. Where is God calling us to yield today? Will we have the courage and the obedience to raise the white flag, to finally let him get in and do the work he's been longing to do in us? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. I thank you for the words of Romans. I love that book, Father. I'm so thankful that your spirit guided the Apostle Paul to write and pen those words that are not only just an encouragement to the church at Rome, but an encouragement to us still today. Father, we thank you for the overwhelming love, mercy, and grace that you show. And today, Father, I pray that as others have heard this message, that we, have, as we all have heard this message, really, Lord, that either we've reconnected with that idea of how wonderful your grace is and we're ready to respond or, or perhaps maybe for the first time we're connecting with that message and we're ready to respond, not by anything we do, but simply by raising a white flag and saying, okay, God, it's your way now. It's your way completely. Father, we love you. I pray that you would guide all of us as we step into the next step that you've put in front of us. We love you, Father, and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. If you have a decision to make, if you'd like to give your life to Christ, bring your membership as an immersed believer, or even simply come for prayer. Let's stand together and worship our God today.
a seat. <laughs> I'm going to have Janet come up here. This is Janet Preston, and she's coming up today just to ask for some prayer, uh, just uh, kind of going through some tough times, if I can share, like just with the, the, uh, the insurance and some <laughs> medical kind of things, concerns, yeah. and uh, just some things really kind of weighing on her heart. And so she comes forward today to ask uh, for prayer, and just that God will kind of help her resolve that situation. So let's go with her. Uh, to in prayer, go before God in prayer, and simply ask uh, for his blessing uh, in her life. Father, we come before you today. I thank you so much, Lord, uh, for Janet coming up and just saying, I need, I need prayer. This is an overwhelming situation to me, uh, concerns for health, concerns for working out, you know, all the details. We know it's such a, it can be such a process, uh, and uh, Lord, and, and so burdensome, and today she's carrying that burden Father, today I, I pray that, that you would help her work, work that out, help us surround her, Lord, in prayer and encouragement in whatever way we can, uh, Lord, and I just pray that you would give her wisdom uh, as she walks through this process and to determine what to do and what needs done. Father, uh, I, I pray that you would provide and uh, just bring clarity for her and also good health. Lord, we pray for her health. We pray that you would uh, provide for, uh, for her clean bill of health in all of this. And again, we just lift up her, Lord. We lift up uh, Kathleen, Elaine, the whole family, Lord. We just pray for them uh, through all of this. We love you, Father, and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We come to a time in our service, another invitation, an invitation to join Christ at his table, to come to remember, to put aside the cares of the world and focus our thoughts on Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And without your sacrifice, we would not have forgiveness of our sins and we would not have eternal life. Father, we are so grateful for that. We pray now that we would come and commune with you at your table and you open it up to us who are believers in Christ. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this time of remembrance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
again, it's been so good to be here together today. I pray that in whatever way God intended, uh, that you have been blessed, encouraged, strengthened by his word and by this time of worship, the, the gathering of the body together. A few announcements before we close today. Uh, of course, a reminder of the ways in which we can give. It's one of the great uh, opportunities we have to exercise our faith is in generosity in so many ways. And uh, God multiplies that in so many ways as well. There are offering boxes, financially speaking, for offering boxes at the rear of the room. There's also options to give online as well as this through the good old U.S. Postal Service as well. <laughs> uh, still, still works. Uh, tonight, a reminder, our, all of our Sunday evening programs kick off this evening. Uh, that means we've got elementary Awana for, grade, for those at K through 5th grade. Uh, Project 412 uh, groups, that's, uh, that's our uh, middle school and high school for Switch. They kick off tonight as well. Uh, and then we have adult groups, Wayne's, uh, Wayne's Bible study, which he's leading in his home. And then, of course, the one that I'll be leading for, uh, for parents here, the teenage, uh, for the one, the three big questions that change every teenager. We'll be meeting in the Connection Cafe here at 5 o'clock uh, later on uh, here today. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, check out the information desk. You can also check out Nick's notes, and there might even be some information on the bulletin today uh, that might be helpful as well. Celebrate Recovery, you've heard us talk a lot about that today. I'm very thankful for that ministry. They meet every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. for the large group meeting, and there is a free meal before that, 5.45 p.m., if you'd like to be a part of that as well. Anyone today in a seat you see with the CR shirt on, like Derek had on earlier, anyone with one of those shirts on would be happy to talk with you about CR if you have questions. So please feel free to, to ask and, uh, and get to know more about that ministry. Uh, because we have everything coming and kicking back off uh, again uh, today, we need everybody, or we need every chair picked up. If you're physically able, if you can help us pick up all the chairs after the service today, we need all the chairs picked up uh, today for all the activities coming today and later this week. At this time, if you'll stand, we have a member of the CR team that's going to be coming forward. They're going to be closing us out with the recitation of the serenity prayer uh, with the closing of our service here. Good morning. My name is Ashley, and I'm a grateful believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And I struggle with anxiety, I struggle with trust, depression, trauma, and alcoholism. Hello. I am with all my heart so thankful for our celebrate recovery here at Northside Christian Church. I would like to thank all of our brothers and sisters who have helped support the ministry, whether it has been helping with our meals, child care contributions, or just showing up to join us. Thank all of you for helping just to keep it alive. This is also a beautiful church itself, and I'm very grateful that we have such a warm and inviting atmosphere to hold our ministry in. Celebrate Recovery has provided me a safe and non-judgmental environment to come to where I'm free to explore healing and share my struggles with a growing relationship with God and others that are just like me. It feels like family when I'm at CR, and I've developed some amazing and long-lasting friendships so far. It has helped me on my struggles that have kept me trapped and separated from the life that God has intended for me. It truly is an outstanding biblical and balanced program for anybody and everybody. So we just want to feed you, and we just want to love on you. You do not have to sign up, just show up. We aren't here to fix one another, but only support one another, while at the same time, we are allowing God to take our pains and take our struggles and just let him take the wheel. That sermon today, just I wanted to add, just really hit home for me. Um, it was the, I had to endure some deep pain um, with Celebrate Recovery, and it saved, it just saved me. <laughs> Just as Hebrews 3.13 tells of us. But encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today. So that none of you can be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It is my honor today just to guide us in the serenity prayer. God. Grant me the serenity to 
because that doesn't, so that cannot change. So we should change the things that I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Literally one day at a time. Each one, one moment at a time. Happy with 